Inside this package is a four-dimensional Rubik's Cube. At least, kind of. Let me explain. You may have already seen the four-dimensional version of a Rubik's Cube, but simulated on a computer. This is Magic Cube 4D, which started development all the way back in 1988. Since we can't literally see in four dimensions, what you're actually looking at is that nebulous four-dimensional puzzle projected down into three dimensions to make it easier to understand, just like how you could take a three-dimensional cube and project that down onto a two-dimensional piece of paper. But if we can simulate a 4D cube on a computer using three dimensions, why not simulate a 4D cube in real life? Well, that's exactly what Melinda Green, one of the original developers of Magic Cube 4D, set out to do about a decade ago. She knew that the original version with three layers, like in the software, would be a little bit too complicated, so instead settled on a two-layered version. Of course, what I'm holding is a two by two by two, whereas what she created is a two by two by two by two. And here it is. Now it of course took a lot of brainstorming to figure out how to physically lay out all the pieces, and of course to actually get it to turn. That was followed by a lot of prototypes using 3D printing, and then eventually this super professional version I'm holding in my hands, which actually uses injection molding. So it looks like we have a DIY version over here, which I'm really excited about. And as you can see, the pieces look just like the ones on any other mass produced puzzle. Now before we get into the crazy details of how this thing actually turns, I wanna see what it's like to put one together. Now the way this puzzle's mechanism works, in short, is 384 magnets. It might seem overkill, but trust me, this is actually the most practical way to implement all the crazy ways that this puzzle can turn. Now the kit also includes this little guide to make sure you get the polarity of all the magnets correct, as well as a wooden lollipop, which is actually used to push the magnets into place. And by the way, if you wanna order one of these yourself, I'll put Melinda's instructions as the first link in the description below. It's $47 for the DIY kit, or $67 for the pre-assembled version, not including shipping, which frankly seems pretty reasonable given the raw materials involved and the sheer amount of work it must take for one individual to essentially create their own puzzle from scratch. So without further ado, I'm gonna get this DIY version assembled and then we can take a closer look at how this crazy puzzle actually works. Alright, that was pretty easy to do, but it was definitely more tedious than I expected, just because of the sheer number of magnets it took probably about an hour, but it definitely gave me a better appreciation for how this thing works. And speaking of, how does this thing turn, and what does it even mean for it to be four-dimensional in the first place? Well, what does it mean for a standard 2x2x2 two by two by two to be three-dimensional? Well, it means that it has three axes. The first axis goes in this direction, through the top and bottom of the cube, and currently has white and yellow on it. The next axis goes in this direction, through the front and back of the cube, currently with green and blue, and the third axis goes in this direction, from the left to the right, and currently has yellow and orange. So then, how about the 2x2x2x2? Two by two by two by two? Well just like before, we have our first axis with white and yellow right here, our second axis with green and blue right here, our third axis with orange and red, hiding in the middle right there, but then, also in this direction, we have this extra fourth axis sort of tacked onto the outside with these pink and purple pieces. It feels a little bit weird having that fourth axis sort of overlapping everything, but again, that's just a consequence of us trying to simulate a true 40 Rubik's Cube in our three-dimensional world. It's gonna feel a little bit weird and asymmetric. The important part is that any moves that you could do in a 40 universe on a 2x2x2x2 two by two by two by two are still possible to simulate on this puzzle. So, how does it turn? Well, on a standard 2x2x2, two by two by two, the cube has eight pieces, and any turn that you do, you're taking half of those pieces, four of them, that kind of form a square, and you're basically rotating that square in two dimensions. So it can be rotated one, two, three, four different ways, and you just choose which one to rotate it to. So on the 2x2x2x2, two by two by two by two, we now have 16 pieces, and once again, anytime we do a turn, it's gonna involve half of them, so eight. And since these eight pieces form a whole 3D cube, doing a single turn consists of actually rotating this cube in 3D space, and then sticking it back on here. So again, instead of spinning a square into one of four different positions, we're now rotating a cube into one of 24 different positions. So all these are different valid turns on this puzzle. Now there's also a few other types of moves that you can do besides just moves like this. In particular, you can do an inner move like this, where you're turning these two middle layers together in any increment of 90 degrees. So that's a valid move, as is that one. And notice that every time I do this, I'm essentially rotating eight pieces all together, just like with the first type of move. You can't, however, do something like this. 
That only involves four pieces, so that's totally illegal, like twisting a corner or something. Now you can also do an outer move like this by 180 degrees, and once again, that involves all eight pieces, so it's totally illegal. But we still have one big problem. Even if we combine all these different types of moves, there's still no way that these pink and purple pieces will ever do anything but just be mixed up with each other. In other words, there's no way for us to swap a pink piece with, say, a white piece or a green piece. And that's a problem. So how do we fix this? Well, we need some way to move these pink and purple pieces out of this awkward outer axis and into one of these other axes where they can more easily be mixed up with the other colors. And the way to do that, hear me out, is we need to four-dimensionally reorient this cube, kind of swap around where the axes are. Think about it like this. Let's say you have a normal 2x2x2, two by two by two, but you're only allowed to do U moves like this. What would you do if you want to mix up the puzzle anymore? That's right, you would reorient it so that now your U moves are affecting a different set of colors. We can reorient again, do some U moves over here, and now things are getting really scrambled up, even though we're only allowed to do one type of move. Now because this is a three-dimensional cube, reorienting it is as simple as just moving it around in our hands. We can swap around where all the different axes are as easy as this. So what does reorienting a cube in four dimensions look like? Well, if we want to take these white and yellow sides and move them, say, from this axis to this axis, that's really easy if we just do that. But now, what if we want to move them from this axis onto this side-to-side -side axis right here? Well, this is actually pretty easy too. What we can just do is pull both cubes apart, rotate them in opposite directions, and put them back together. And once again, we have reoriented the cube, no problem. Notice that the puzzle is still actually solved. Everything still matches up just like it was before. The colors are just in slightly different spots. But now, here's the tricky one. What if we want to reorient our puzzle so that the white and yellow pieces are on this fourth weird outer axis where the pink and purple pieces are now? Well, to do that, you need an algorithm called a gyro. There's actually a bunch of different ways to do it. This is just one in particular that I happened to learn. But after doing a handful of moves, you can see that our white and yellow are now on the outside. Now, even though it looked like I just scrambled this puzzle up a bunch, here's the crazy thing. It's still solved. Everything still matches up exactly like it did before, but once again, the colors are just in a slightly different spot. So effectively, whether you're doing a simple reorientation like this, like this, or that whole entire gyro algorithm, you're technically not turning the puzzle at all. In other words, you could do any of those things during your 15 seconds of inspection, and it would be totally fine. You couldn't do this, that would be doing a turn, but as long as you're doing this, or a gyro, that's just reorienting. Now I promise that doing a gyro, that four-dimensional reorientation, finally allows us to fully scramble up the puzzle. So let's try it. We can do our normal moves like this, like this, and like this. And now if we do a gyro from, say, this position, now all of these pieces will be the ones that are on the outside of the puzzle, rather than white and yellow. Let's try it. There we go. So now we got some orange red, some pink and purple, and some green and blue. Things are already starting to look very mixed up, but we can do even more. There are actually some shortcuts that you can use to scramble it a little bit more efficiently without having to do that gyro algorithm a bunch of times. I think what you actually do is put it into an illegal state like this, do some turns, spin the cubes around, and then put it back into a legal state, and that just gets things mixed up a little bit faster. So now that I've hopefully explained what a 2x2x2x2 two by two by two by two is and how it turns, I still have to learn how the heck to solve it. Melinda actually keeps track of everyone who's ever solved it with a big list on her website, and I need to get myself onto that list before this video is over. Luckily, there are some great tutorials on how to solve it right here on YouTube. I've been watching one by Rowan Fortier, which I'll link below. He seems to have some of the best higher dimensional cubing content on YouTube. So I guess this is the part of the video where I sit in front of a screen for a few hours, learn exactly how to solve it, get some practice in, and then report back on how it goes. All right, it's the next day now, and that was a lot of fun. I spent a few hours rewatching the tutorial and just making sure I was comfortable with everything. And then I got out a timer and started doing some time practice solves. And within a couple hours, I managed to get a 221 single, which I think is pretty darn good, especially since it wasn't particularly lucky, just a very solid solve. The link to the full solve video will be down in the description if you want to watch it, and hopefully also on Melinda's list of people who've solved this puzzle. I will say, if you're a cuber who's made it this far into the video and you haven't understood any of the four dimensional stuff, you might still really enjoy this puzzle. As long as you learn what the legal moves are, it's really not any different than learning how to solve any other type of twisty puzzle. The method that I learned relies a lot on the Ortega method from the standard 2x2x2, so if you already know that, learning this thing should actually be a breeze. There's really only two extra algorithms, the gyro and an easy parity case, so if you're into solving puzzles, I would say give it a shot, it's probably easier than you think. I will quickly scramble this thing up just to give you an idea of what the method looks like. It's actually pretty clever the way that it takes advantage of the limitations of the physical puzzle, with that outer axis being kind of awkward to get to, to actually make it easier to solve. So first up, we choose a pair of opposite colors, in this case I'll choose white and yellow, and our ultimate goal is to get all the white and yellow pieces 
onto that weird outer axis. But to get there, we first start doing some intuitive moves to just pair them all up into sides like this. So here I'm about to create a second side right there, and I'll go ahead and put that opposite of the first side. And now to get the last two sides, we have to start doing this really clever thing called RKT, where basically we just start turning this left side as if it were a two by two. But since that's not legal, anytime we wanna do a turn on this side, on this mini two by two, we just do the opposite turn on this side, and that doesn't mess up anything that we have over here. So we just keep this right side in the same orientation, while rotating this left one around like crazy to do all the different two by two moves that we wanna do on it until eventually we can get our third side right there, no problem. And now to get the fourth and final side, we do have to start doing some gyros to get these pieces out of that outer axis. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So now you can see those four pieces are actually accessible and this is gonna sound crazy, but what we have to do next is set them up into an OLL case. This is actually one of the easiest ones that you can get because we can really easily just set it up into this H case right here. And now after gyroing back to how we had it before, we can just execute this OLL. It's actually a little bit easier because we don't care about which color is which. So we just do this. And now you can see we have all four sides complete. And then here's the really clever part. All we have to do now is a gyro, and then all these white and yellow pieces will be stuck on that outer axis forever, and we never have to worry about them getting mixed up with any other colors. There we go. Now all the white and yellow pieces are all on the outside, which means that we can now solve the entire rest of the puzzle without doing a single other gyro. If the whole gyroing thing hurts your brain a little bit, you could just scramble up this puzzle without doing any, and this is basically what it would be like to solve. It's kind of like an easier version that you can use to get used to the turning. So this is the part where you stare at the puzzle for a while until you finally find two pieces that go together and we can pair them up like this pretty intuitively then once you find another two that go next to there you again intuitively pair them up like this and then we can match everything up and there we go there's our first layer and from now on it's kind of just more of that intuitive block building all the way until you finish the first mini two by two so here we have another block right here which i'll put down where it needs to go just like that and then getting this last block is a little bit tricky. We have to start doing those RKT moves again. So basically we match up the block on this side of the puzzle, and then we can just do a few intuitive moves to match them up like this, and then match them up with the other side like this, and we now have our first half of the puzzle complete. But now the really cool thing is, this other half of the puzzle is now literally just a two by two. Again, we can't turn it like a two by two because that would be illegal. Instead, we just have to turn it while doing one single turn over and over again on this other side of the cube. So we can go ahead and make our first side right there. Now I see we have to do an anti soon to get our opposite side. So it gets really tedious having to do every single turn like this just to make sure that things stay legal. And then eventually, we can go ahead and look at this. Now we have an easy PBL case and we can just finish this up with our normal algorithm. We just finish up the cube on the left, and as long as we've done everything correctly along the way, oh no, we have a parity case. So it might not look like it, but this is actually possible to solve. Again, you're not allowed to do just a single turn on one side of the puzzle, but you can actually end up a double turn away from being solved with no obvious way to solve it. But fortunately, there is a very easy algorithm that you can do to fix this. It's basically just doing a checkerboard pattern on one of the cubes. So here we have our very pretty checkerboard. Basically the way I remember it is we just do a U move and then we undo that checkerboard pattern. And then finally we can undo that turn and then magically the double move has gone away and we can go ahead and solve our puzzle. There we go. Now, obviously I left a lot of details out. So if you really wanna learn how to solve one of these things, just go watch Rowan's tutorial linked in the description. So overall, Melinda's two by two by two by two has been a ton of fun. Whether you wanna nerd out about all the mathematical details, convince yourself that it really is equivalent to a four dimensional Rubik's cube and figure out all the analogs to a normal two by two. Or if you don't care about any of that and you just like learning how to solve fun puzzles, getting faster, maybe doing some speed solving, it's just as fun on that side as well. Again, if you wanna buy one, the link will be down in the description. I don't get anything out of it, but Melinda did send these to me personally, and I really do think they are pretty cool. And if you just want to learn more about higher dimensional cubing or hypercubing, I'll put some links down in the description that I found helpful. I think I just created a two by two by two by two by two. Just kidding, that's not how that works. I really enjoyed making this video. It was a lot of information to take in and try and explain simply. So I hope you guys enjoyed too, because that's pretty much it. And I'll see you guys next time.